This is such a comforting smell. Yeah. Like, yeah, and it's like, each... like a warm, like you can, bread is so comforting mm -hmm. and it, that feels like the heart of, of all bread to me right now. Yeah. Welcome to the Food 52 Test Kitchen. My name is Josh, I'm here with Sarah Owens. We're gonna be talking about sourdough starter, which I know almost nothing about and you know a ton about. So I'm very excited. We're gonna learn what is it, how do you make it, how do you keep it alive, how do you use it. And at the end of this video, some of my Food 52 coworkers have brought in their own sourdough starters. Oh, We're wow. gonna lift the lid and sort of see what's going on in there. I don't know hardly anything. What is a starter? Let's just begin with zero, like. Yeah. 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 So a sourdough starter is really basic. It's flour and water. Okay. But within this culture of flour and water, we have primarily two different types of microbes. Um, wild yeasts, which everyone sort of knows about when they think about a sourdough starter, mm -hmm. but also um, bacteria. Those things are mm -hmm. working together, they're like helping exactly. each other out. Yeah. What's interesting about a sourdough culture is that we have this bacteria. And we don't have that with like the packets of yeast that you buy at the store. Right. You're basically, when you use that or when you buy that, it's one strain of yeast mm -hmm. that you're using to leaven your bread. With a sourdough culture, you have both the bacteria and lots of different species of yeast. Mm -hmm. um, the bacteria works to uh, sort of pre-digest the flour, mm -hmm. and as a byproduct of that fermentation, it gives off uh, lactic and acetic acids. Is that where flavor comes from? That's where, exactly. Okay. So you know more than you think you do. <laughs> I read the Wikipedia um, this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> Should we talk about what you brought today? Absolutely. So I brought three different starters. Mm -hmm. um, I normally keep one, but lately I've been using each of these for different applications sure. in the kitchen. Um, this is my favorite. I call it the Beast. Okay. Um, it's a sourdough starter maintained with rye flour. Is there a story behind the name? Uh, <laughs> it's just a it really like vigorous, very beast. strong culture. Each one is going to have a different aroma. Yeah. And um, the rye one often, to me, smells grassy, kind of a little bit like honey. Um, so this one I love to use for making bread. Um, I think rye, the, the enzymes in rye have a very particular relationship with the acidity of sourdough. Hmm. It's very beneficial. So just using a little bit of rye, either um, in your starter or your leaven that goes into your bread dough, I think really encourages fermentation. Hmm. So that's my favorite one to use for bread dough. So you would when just When you say leaven, it. just for people who may uh -huh. not know, what, yeah. is, what does that mean? So leaven, it's really just a semantics thing. Leaven is the intermediate step between your starter and your bread dough. Okay. So you're always using some of the starter to make leaven, but you're keeping some behind. The leaven, you use all of it in your recipe. The leaven becomes bread. Yes. Cool. Um, and I could use it for everything, but I find that this guy, um, or lady, this is princess. Okay. So this is also um, made from bread flour. Totally different aroma on this Very one. different. You can tell, I don't know if you can actually see, but uh, the surface of this sourdough starter has more of a bubbly, kind of viscous appearance. So these are both maintained with the same ratio of water to flour. So this one I use a lot um, because I make other things besides bread. While we're on the subject, what are a few things that you would use a starter for besides bread? I love to make crackers, mm -hmm. um, sourdough pancakes, waffles, basically anything that you make you can whip a little sourdough starter into. Anything that would be a dough. A dough, a batter, um, right. so you can whip it into cakes. Um, mm -hmm. Often when I make cookies, I'll just... Um, at the creaming stage, I'll just throw a little bit in and make sure it's whipped into that stage before adding really the cool. dry ingredients. And the flavor is like noticeable in the end result? It or depends is it on, it, it can be subtle, it can be strong. It depends mm -hmm. on how long after you mix the dough or batter mm -hmm. that you let it sit before baking. Sounds like there's sort of infinite possibilities for experimenting. There is, yeah, cool. there is, and I a like, lot of wiggle room. Like certain areas of food where you could spend a lifetime learning and mm -hmm. still it's like the tip of the iceberg, you know? Yeah, and I've been doing this a long time and I still am learning and part of that
that is also just learning how to break the rules. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a yeah. lot of people think this is a really strict sort of thing that if they do the wrong step, they're gonna kill their starter. Right. But it's really just learning the cues of fermentation so that you can tweak it to be whatever you need it to be for your schedule and your preference. That's interesting. So I just wanna introduce you to one last um, starter. This is my brown rice starter. It okay. has a really different aroma. Hmm. Yeah. It reminds me, I mean, I've sometimes I've seen like jasmine rice in tap water mm -hmm. and strained out and mm -hmm. you, like just your drinking water has like uh -huh. a little bit of a floral flavor. Yeah, yeah. So these are the three starters that I keep. So if you made a bread with a brown rice starter mm -hmm. and you made another bread with a rye starter, how mm -hmm. different would they be in flavor, or texture? Yeah, they're quite different. So um, I use this one primarily to make a gluten-free sourdough. Okay. It's kind of dense. Um, you can slice it really thinly. But uh, if I make a wheat bread mm -hmm. using the rye starter or leaven as opposed to the wheat starter or leaven, um, I do notice a discernible difference in the complexity of the flavor. Hmm. Um, is the and rye one a little more complex? I think it's more complex. Yeah. Yeah, and it really doesn't take a lot to, to give it that um, difference. Yeah. We talked about the benefits of sourdough starter. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're someone with no starter mm -hmm. in, at all. How yeah. do you begin? Like, where do you start? Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, which starter would you like to use to create your starter. You know, I'm a native New Yorker, so I feel like I have to go with the beast. All right, okay, <laughs> my favorite. Okay, so basically, um, to create a sourdough starter, mm -hmm. you can do it in several different ways. You can do it from scratch using flour and water. Mm -hmm. You can um, buy a starter from different online sources, mm -hmm. um, either dehydrated or in a liquid form. Um, there's a lots of different ways to approach this. The easiest way is just for someone to give you some. Okay. So that's what we're gonna do today. So you've got your jar. Yeah. All right, so let's turn on the scale. Bring it to zero grams. Sure. And weigh your jar. The reason why I like to do this step mm -hmm. is because when you move on to maintenance, mm -hmm. so if you know the weight of your jar, you can just set your jar with a starter in it on the scale subtract the weight of the jar, and then you know how much starter you okay. have. Okay, so like write down the weight of your jar, memorize it. Yeah, it's really a good idea to keep a journal Yeah. Um, when you're first starting with uh, sourdough to be able to take notes of the temperature, the mm. time of day, um, how you're feeling. <laughs> so to get started, mm. we're gonna maintain, uh, create and maintain our new sourdough starter using equal parts by weight. Okay. Um, so go ahead and take out 50 grams of starter and put it in your new jar. Sure. And now we're going to add 50 grams of water. Great. Cool. Great. And then use your spoon. Just kind of stir that up, sort of break up the starter. Mm -hmm. That's going to be make it easier for you to disperse the ripe starter in the new culture. You just want to get it kind of like a, into a slurry. Sure. And now it's time to feed it flour. Okay. All right, so we're doing equal parts. How much flour are you gonna feed it? Well, 50 grams. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Would you give it just like exclusively rye flour? I would. I think it's important to choose a type of flour that you're gonna use mm -hmm. and stick with that. Again, a lot of the microbes that we're culturing are on the flour itself. Right. Um, so if you can be as consistent as possible in your bread pra practice. So that it has an identity. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay, so you just fed it 50 grams yeah. of flour and that's equal parts by weight to the weight of the starter. Right. Now we could, if we wanted to, over I feel like I'm in a math class now. I'm like, <laughs> I gotta really focus. <laughs> so we could always overfeed our starter. Starter. Mm -hmm. Um, we could give it 100 grams of flour, 150 grams of flour okay. if we needed to bulk up our starter yeah. for a recipe. What we never want to do is underfeed the starter or feed it less flour than the weight of the starter. It needs at least the weight of the starter, okay. if not more. So <laughs> what you need to do next is stir up the, the flour water starter. Uh -huh. 
Um, the starches are converting to sugars, the microbes wake up, and they start feeding. Okay. So they need time in order to feed. So once you get that really stirred up well, keep stirring, um, and make sure you really get it off the bottom and into the top. Okay. Um, no dry flour remaining. And then once you get it really stirred up and it looks like a consistent um, sort of paste, mm -hmm. try to use your spoon to kind of pack it down. Um, because what you want to be able to do, especially when you're starting out, is to be able to look on the side and see the fermentation activity. And if you kind of push it down into one even layer mm -hmm. um, before you position the lid, then you're going to be able to watch that throughout the course of its feeding. So go ahead and position the lid. Now that we've made this yes. and the lid is on not too tight, mm -hmm. where do we store it? Okay. So an ideal temperature for this to ferment okay. for 8 to 12 hours is 75 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a little warmer like it is right now, um, it's just going to encourage the fermentation to go a little faster. If it's cooler in your house or in your kitchen, then it's going to slow down the fermentation. Mm -hmm. That's why there's that window of 8 to 12 hours. But basically what you're looking for is for the starter to at least double in size. So that's the, the carbon dioxide, which is the byproduct of yeast fermentation, mm -hmm. is lifting the starter. Mm -hmm. That's when you know it's active. Sometimes when you're first uh, starting out with a, a new sourdough and you've not made bread very much before, you can't remember the timing. You're mm -hmm. like, was it six hours? Was it 12 hours? Um, this is just kind of a nice compass right. to help you um, sort of observe the behavior of your starter. Okay, so we're gonna perform the float test. We're gonna use a clean spoon to dip into the starter and we're gonna try not to like mix it up too much which would deflate it. Right. Um, so I'm just gonna grab a nice um, plop of starter mm -hmm. and scoop it off into the water. Yeah. Oh, good girl. <laughs> So we can see now it's floating, mm -hmm. um, and that's an indication that there's plenty of carbon dioxide gas as a byproduct of yeast fermentation, mm -hmm. that it's healthy and ready to leaven our bread, or to make leaven to leaven our bread. Cool. Okay, so once we've performed a float test and we know our starter is fully fed, mm -hmm. we have several different options. Take some of your starter mm -hmm. to make either a leaven or a recipe that calls for a refreshed starter. Another thing, if you're kind of crunched on time, you don't want to make another recipe, mm -hmm. you can stick it in the refrigerator. Okay. So it's fully fed, it's been sitting out for eight to 12 hours, you see that it floats or that it's doubled in size, just plop it in the fridge. Okay. Make sure the lid is always loose right. so it can exhale that carbon dioxide. When you put it in the fridge, it's going to go fairly dormant, but it's still going to be a little bit active, mm -hmm. just imperceptibly so. So always leave the lid a little bit loose. Let's say you're out of town, so you have to be gone for like two weeks or something. Mm -hmm. How do you maintain the health of your starter that way? You're just going to take it with you. I'm uh. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I do, there's a couple of different options. What I do is I'll feed it twice back to back. Mm -hmm. So I'll feed it in the morning, let it ferment for eight to 12 hours, mm -hmm. feed it at night, and then the next morning I put it in the fridge. Okay. When I get back, so say it's been two or three weeks, yeah. when I get back, I do that same thing. It may take three feedings, mm -hmm. but my test is gonna be, again, the float test. What happens is in the fridge, if it sits for a long time, the acids start to build up. Mm -hmm you'll see like liquid forming on the top. Okay. Um, and that's when you know you need to do this like back-to-back -back feeding, regardless of whether you're in or out of town. Sure. Um, because everybody keeps the refrigerator at different temperatures and it can affect the fermentation. Yeah. yeah. I guess once you've had a starter for a while, you sort of know how it's supposed to look and how mm -hmm. it's supposed to smell. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's the sort of thing where you have like a feel for it after yes. a certain amount of time. Yeah, yeah. And it helps if you name your starter. <laughs> um, because the more affectionate you are toward your starter, the more likely you are to take better care of it. All right. 
So have you thought of a name? I've been thinking about it. I, I maybe I'll try and reveal it at the end. I don't. Okay. I don't have a good idea yet. You kind of have to get to know it first. Yeah. You know? Right. Like I barely even met my starter. Like I, yeah. maybe I need to spend some time with it before yeah, I give it a name. Yeah. Some quality time. Yeah. So we talked about the three starters that you brought in. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna bring in two more starters that some people from the office have made and we can sort of oh, compare and like okay. see how healthy they are. So we're here with Erin and Joanna who have brought in their own sourdough starter. We also have sourdough starter from two of my coworkers, Zoe and Dave, who's behind the camera over there. We're gonna open them all up. We're gonna see how they're different, how they're similar do like a little evaluation basically. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So do you guys want to introduce your starters? If it has a name, <laughs> tell me. Uh, when you fed it last, what you feed it with. Just sure. a little bit about your yeah. maintenance. You're yeah. like the, the, the starter doctor over here. <laughs> tell me your symptoms. Yes. Um, Mike's starter actually came from Zoe's starter here. Oh, wow. She gave it to me a few weeks, maybe about a month ago. Okay. Um, and I've been feeding it um, mostly when I'm trying to make bread, so okay. sometimes every other weekend. I fed it once this morning before I left for mm -hmm. work and then mm -hmm. when I got to the office. Okay. And I usually use AP flour. Uh -huh. um, I tried some whole wheat flour once and I felt like it really um, weighed it down. Uh -huh. But I'm like a novice with all of this stuff, okay. so I would love for you to. And is it, um, is it flour that you buy at the store or you get it from the mill? Yeah, no, I'll, um, I get it from Whole, Whole Foods. Okay. Yeah, I'll mm -hmm. use like an unbleached uh -huh. AP flour. Okay, cool. And does it have a name? No. <laughs> no name. <laughs> oh, it's very, so I would say this is very lactic, which is um, kind of a way of saying it's very creamy and mild. Okay. Um, is it bad? No, I can, it's fine. I can <laughs> okay. see it's very healthy because there are fermentation bubbles sort of popping through the surface. Okay. Um, it looks very billowy. I can see fermentation bubbles on the side. Mm -hmm. um, so this looks and smells like a very healthy starter. Okay. I do not have a name for my starter either. <laughs> um, I've had this for five or six years. Okay, a long time. Uh, What's the longest you've ever known? A starter like what's the longest a starter people have brought me yeah. yeah people have brought me like their hundred year old starter that like wow. their great grandmother kept in Alaska <laughs> <laughs> um, which you know honestly like a starter that's a month old is gonna perform the same as a starter that's a hundred years old as long as both are healthy so I feed mine here I'll let you smell it evaluate oh wow <laughs> um, nice Mine's half whole wheat, half white flour, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and that's pretty much how I've always kept it. Mm -hmm. um, I can smell that this mm. has almost like a toasty aroma to it, and mm. I think it's that whole wheat flour inclusion, um, but it looks and smells yeah. very happy. So, good! So where do you keep your starter when you're not using it? I keep it on the counter in like a deli, a quart-sized deli container covered with cheesecloth and a rubber band just around the uh -huh. top. Um, and usually I feed it at night if I'm going to make bread the next day. So like mm -hmm. I'll, if I'm going to make bread on Sunday, I'll feed it like Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And then it's good to go on Sunday morning. Okay. Um, cool. And then frequently it kind of just sits there and I forget about it for a couple of days. <laughs> um, and then I'll feed it again on Wednesday or Thursday to get it going for the next okay. weekend. So if I'm yeah. making bread every week. If so if you store your starter on the counter and that's your sch regular schedule. Mm -hmm. I think consistency is key. If you store it in the refrigerator, again, just kind of stick to the same. Um, but that's that's great. Cool. Yeah. Where do you keep your starter? Uh, same thing, yeah, in mm -hmm. a core container. I don't put the, um, I just have the lid on the like jar. Uh-huh. So maybe it should be aerated a little bit more. Yeah, so I think it's a good idea to just leave the lid kind of loose mm -hmm. or popped um, to allow the carbon dioxide gas to exhale. Yeah. Um, one thing I would suggest is to keep it in a glass or ceramic container, um, just because a sourdough starter is very acidic um, and acidity will eat away at plastics. Um, so that's just one thing to kind of be aware of. I guess one final question I had was where you get your flour from. I used to buy it locally when I lived back in Georgia, 
Um, but obviously don't know as many farmers up here or as sure. big mills. Is there places you prefer? Yeah, so I actually have a whole resources um, page on my website oh, for okay. mills all over, um, mostly the U.S. and Canada. And then are you storing your flour in the fridge or at room temperature? Yeah, that's also a good question. Mm -hmm. So I, again, I'm using mostly stone ground flour, um, which has all of the germ oils present in the flour. Um, so it's really important to store that flour at cool or cold temperatures in order to maintain the integrity of the, the oils. Um, so I store mine, if I'm not going to go through it quickly, either in the refrigerator or the freezer. All right, Joanna, thanks for bringing your starters. Uh, it was fun to get to yeah. talk about them. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the feedback. <laughs> Absolutely, anytime. It was really fun to get to see such a wide variety of like what a starter can be. I think I like understand a little bit how, like the thrill of baking, because one loaf of bread is never going to be exactly the same as the next. So we're wrapping up this episode about starters, and I want to tease all the viewers out there to come and watch the next episode next week about sourdough bread. If you want more videos like this, if you want to see Sarah make some bread, like and subscribe.